Now, I would like to move into what's on your outline. I'm calling Geographical Jesus. So we bring everything we've just talked about for the last two hours over into our reading of the New Testament. So what I want you to do is take your Bible and open up to Matthew. And so hold one page, you know, if you're in your Bible, so hold your Matthew page. And then also flip over to Luke. So I want you to have the two infancy narratives available to you. So that's Matthew 1 and 2. And then Luke chapter 2. You could say 1 and 2, but so Luke 1 and 2. Okay, let's do the easy one. Or not easy. I want to do a little bit of comparison. So let's start with Luke. Okay, every children's Christmas pageant ever in your church starts with what? In those days, right, Caesar Augustus, right? In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed or registered, depending on your translation. Uh, so starting with Luke, okay, so then what happens? So you, you, whoever you've chosen to be Mary and Joseph, this is, the census happens, then the little kids do what next? It's the next movement. They start walking. But are they both really walking? She's on a donkey, let's face it. She's on a donkey. He's walking. Um, okay, so, so they head where? Bethlehem. Why? Because it's, it's where Joseph is from. Okay, oh wait. Yeah, so, so, okay. So you're in Luke 2. So let's just look at Luke 2 because we want to make sure we're not just making stuff up. Um, okay, so in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Um, the, the first it was the first registration was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. So I'm going to avoid a whole lecture on Luke, even though I really want to give a whole lecture on Luke. But what's interesting about Luke is he sets the Christian story into the context of um, it's not just Christian history; it's it's Jewish history, but it's it's Roman history and it's world history. So it's very interesting. He starts his story by telling us Quirinius was governor of Syria. That Jesus' story is part of, of the world story. So, uh, um, whereas Matthew starts the story where? With Abraham. So Matthew's is a Jewish story. Luke is a lot more expansive um, in a lot of ways. Okay, so this was the first registration. Okay, they all go to their own towns to be registered. Jo Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. Okay, so where is Jesus technically from in Luke? Would you say? Nazareth. He's from Nazareth. The only reason he ends up in Bethlehem is because of the census. Then what happens? They go there, they do all this stuff, the shepherds come, ah, sing their song, he gets born, a lot of great stuff happens, they present him in the temple, and then what happens? They go home. All right, so he's from Galilee, he's from Nazareth. Um, they return in 39. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. I'm in Luke uh, 2, verse 39. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. And the next thing you know, he's uh, then on into Jerusalem in the temple. He's 12 and you know, we don't hear anything about 0 to 12. Okay, so that's Luke. Now I'll flip over to Matthew. We saw we start with the genealogy. We read through part of that, which again ends this way. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon... 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. Now, the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. Okay, and we hear the story, Mary, uh, Joseph taking Mary, even though she's pregnant, 
um, uh, and and Jesus um, is born. Okay, and so he. Um, where are they then at the beginning of chapter two of Matthew? They're in Bethlehem. Why? Okay. Is there any notion that he came from Nazareth to Bethlehem? For all we know, if we're just reading Matthew and you never heard of Luke, you don't know anything about a registration and a governor and all that kind of stuff. You just know 2-1. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east, so, you know, so from, oh, where's my pointer? So, you know, the east being, so we should say all the Abraham story and all that business happens like over in the Iraq, Iran uh, region. So when they say, you know, to the east, it's, you know, east of a, uh, of the Jordan, all right? And so um, the Magi come from the east to King Herod, and then we hear um, in verse five, they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for it has been written by the prophet, and this is what you mean, that he, he had to be there. I think you meant because scripture says it, and Matthew cares greatly about tying everything to scripture, which for him is the Old Testament. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Okay. So, then what happens? You've got your, um, so Jesus is born, um, and then luckily your Christmas pageant's over because you're like, this is Christmas, we're done. We don't have to get into all the more complicated stuff that's coming after this because you really don't want to do what's coming next with a bunch of little kids because it's very harrowing and depressing. Um, yeah, I had this brilliant idea one time. I have a lot of brilliant ideas that kind of come and go, or maybe they were never brilliant in the first place, which is why they go. And I decided, you know what? I'm tired, my family doesn't read enough scripture. I'm gonna just impose scripture reading. I mean, invite my family to experience scripture. So I'm like, you know what's happening now? Every Christmas morning, before all this gifts and all this, we are just gonna reread, you know? We're gonna reread the story. This is actually what this is about, honestly. You know, so I'm sitting there, my kids are small, you know, and we're like reading through, and then you know, like, you know, I'm like, we're gonna read the whole thing, one, you know, one and two. Next thing you know, you're talking about Rachel weeping for her children, massacre, you know? And my daughter's like, I don't think God, you know, does that kind of thing, like cause a, a reference to the Passover, you know, killing all the firstborn children. Chloe's like, I'm a firstborn child, but I am female, so maybe it doesn't apply. But she's like, I think even if Caleb was oldest, God wouldn't be slaughtering him. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know what? So we don't do that anymore. We just open presents. Um, <laughs> we let the professional ministers do their job. Whatever my kids need they, to get on a Christmas morning, I leave that to the pastoral staff of my church. Um, yeah, there's a lot of bad stories like that um, from parent, me being your parent. It's bad, um, but I don't want to digress. So there, he's born in Bethlehem, and where does he end up next? Does he go back to Nazareth? No, he ends up in Egypt. Why? But the reason he has to go to Egypt is because what happens if he stays? He's going to get killed. So the actual real world political reality is he's gonna get killed, right? So he has to go to Egypt to live, okay? Now King Herod, so we'll, okay, so he goes to Egypt, we'll come back to that. He goes to Egypt, because you know there's an angel tells Joseph in a dream, and of course we could get into all of that, Joseph a dreamer, Old Testament, etc. Matthew loves the Old Testament. So then the angel tells him to take him from Egypt after Herod dies and it's safe. Take him where? What happens after they, they go to Nazareth? So the, Jesus ends up in Nazareth quite a bit later. You see the difference in the two stories and probably most of you already studied that. Um, but in case you haven't, I didn't grow up in church so it's funny, if you don't grow up in church when you're an adult, there's a lot of stories, everybody who grew up with Christmas pageants and all of that, everybody who's an adult in the room thinks you know it because you're an adult, 
And so when you're an adult who didn't grow up in church and you missed out on this, you always feel ignorant because you're like, I'm the only one in the room who's actually never heard this story that everybody's like, everybody knows this story. So I always do try to err on the side of the fact that there might be people like me out there who had no idea what y'all were talking about um, when I'd show up to your church. Um, so when Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for those who are seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea, and Judea is down here, right? So now Archelaus is, is ruling over Judea uh, in place of his father Herod. He was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. Okay, two very different stories okay, about place and land and home and theology and geography and all the things we've been touching on um, here. Okay, so I want to take a minute, though, to talk about how the geography, knowing the geography affects the theology. So, we studied all that Old Testament stuff this morning. Where is the movement in the Exodus? Okay. Moses is born where? In Egypt. And where does he have to go? Because there's a scary ruler who wants to, first of all, there's a ruler who kills all the firstborn children, Pharaoh, right? But then when and Moses makes it past that, and then as an adult, right, he has to flee from Egypt to save his life from Pharaoh. And so he ends up in, in right, but eventually, right, they, they end up, um, right. So anyway, he flees Egypt for safety to go to the promised land. Technicality, he doesn't get to the promised land, but let's just say he's headed to the promised land. All right, so he has to go from Egypt, the persecuting place, to go to safety in, in, right. How does this relate? If you know the story of Moses, how does it help you start to understand what, Ma how Matthew is trying to depict Jesus and who he is? Say something to me about that. So what, ha so what happens, what you see Matthew doing so Jesus, Matthew depicts Jesus, one of the chief Christological categories for Matthew. By Christological, it's a big word meaning what an author has to say about Christ, who he is, what he's about, why we should care, what it means for us. So he is a new Moses. For Matthew, Jesus is the new Moses. And you'll see the typology, we call it, throughout Matthew. So by typology, we mean this, the thing that, um, so, so Moses is the type and Jesus is the anti-type. That's the technical language when you're doing typology. So Moses provides the type, the kind of template, the format. Then Matthew comes and puts Jesus on that template is one way to put it. And Jesus is the anti-type, which it sounds like it's something opposite of Moses, but it's actually he is another Moses. He's the new Moses. The first Moses had an exodus. So in Matthew, what you see in effect is what we would call a reverse exodus. So now Jesus is actually born in the promised land, but now the leader of his tradition, his homeland, so to speak, the Jewish leader, Herod, takes on the role of Pharaoh. Right? Because, and that's this part. When Herod saw he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated. He sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what, Je what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Re Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. So, Herod now becomes Pharaoh, slaughters the innocents, just like Pharaoh did. And now Jesus has to leave and go to Egypt for safety. It's not the only way, by the way, that Jesus uh, is like Moses. Um, 
In Luke, where does Jesus deliver his famous sermon? The sermon on the... In Luke. Yeah, in Luke, it's the sermon on the plain. Only in Matthew is it called the Sermon on the Mount. Of course, that's the one we all know and love because the Beatitudes, bless our meat, we all memorize those, don't we? Yes. Um, okay, so, so why, if you start to see through this geography, from the very beginning of Matthew, geography is everything. You already see it in the genealogy. Okay? So why does Matthew have to have Jesus giving his famous ethical body of Christian ethics encapsulated, why would it have to be on a mountain for Moses? You see? That's where Moses received the Ten Commandments from God. So some people might want to ask me the question or whatever, okay, but what's true? What happened? Where was it really? Was it on a plane? Did he give it twice? You know, and those are all fine questions to ask. I don't want to talk about those right now because to me, quite honestly, they're a distraction from the theological message Matthew is trying to tell you about who Jesus is in the history of God with human beings. And in fact, I mean, he's a lot of things. And the very first thing Jesus is called to Matthew is, what's the first name he's given, so to speak? In 123, yeah, right? They name, they name Jesus, well, Jesus, I guess we should say. Um, is his name. Um, so two things. Um, she will bear a son in 21. She will bear a son and you are to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sin because the name Jesus comes from the word to deliver. Yasha. It's the same name as Joshua. So the Hebrew name Joshua is the same thing as the name Jesus. So also Matthew is piling up. I mean, because Jesus of Nazareth really existed, by the way. I don't want to get so metaphorical that you walk out of here thinking there was no Jesus. I mean, Jesus of Nazareth is a historical person. There's no question about that, who was, in fact, crucified by Pontius Pilate. You can read that in Josephus. You can read that in non-Christian non stuff. But once we get beyond that bare historical fact of Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, you start getting into theology and like, okay, what does it mean? Who is Jesus? That's who was Jesus, but also who is you know, the risen Lord we follow. Um, and this is very, very important to understand because he's Jesus, so he saves his people from their sins, Right? You're in a Jewish worldview. And then, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And you see that word El, which we've seen repeatedly all morning. Peniel, I've seen the face of God, and yet I live. Beit El, Bethel, right? This is the house of God, because I have encountered God here. So these places, right? So anything with the El. And now Jesus, again, becomes the locus or the, the main place that Christians experience God, the presence of God. Does that make sense? Okay, so, um, so it's a reverse, um, a reverse exodus going on. And then as I said, you'll see this then mapped out all the way through. So of course Jesus has to receive, has to give this thing the sermon on a mount because it's being equated with Moses uh, receiving the law. It's also the case um, that we're reminded, you know, so all of this matters for our Christian history and our identity and our understanding of who Jesus is. Obviously, he saves. That gets us into the question of soteriology. How does Jesus save? Who does he save? Why? How do you get saved? Et cetera, et cetera. You start by eating testaments. Um, so if you... Uh, uh, but the other kind of thing I want to pull out from this story now, related to our subject, politically speaking, right, Jesus has to seek asylum in Egypt because the ruler of his land is trying to kill him. So I wonder if you find it fair to say Jesus was a refugee in Egypt. So it's just something to think about. I'm not insisting on it. I'm not trying to rabble rouse. I don't know most people in the room. We're a very big group. Okay? But I just want to put that out there for 
because we all Christians are talking about even how we deal with current refugees and it gets into the issue for Christians how do you apply the Bible from antiquity to now etc so I just want to put that out there um, the Roman Empire put a lot of people on the move a lot of people got dislocated by the way governments worked in their time um, there's a lot of emphasis in scripture and a lot, of, a lot of emphasis on the fact even the patriarchs and the, and the main leaders of our Judeo-Christian heritage themselves were at some point dislocated geographically, and they were foreigners in another land. Um, so I'm sure many of you have seen uh, the poem, Home. Uh, and so I've, it's by Warsaw Shire, a British uh, Somali poet. Um, talking about the Syrian refugee crisis. And uh, yeah, so in honor of kind of Jesus and his experience and Joseph's experience of moving family and trying to keep his wife and child alive with, with all these hostile forces, the poem goes like this. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbor is running faster than you the boy you went to school with who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factory is holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one would leave home unless home chased you, fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. It's not something you ever thought about doing. And so when you did, you carried the anthem under your breath, waiting until the airport toilet to tear up the passport and swallow each mouthful of paper, making it clear that you would not be going back. You have to understand, no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. Who would choose to spend days and nights in the stomach of a truck unless the miles traveled meant something more than journey? No one would choose to crawl under fences, be beaten until your shadow leaves you, raped, then drowned, forced to the bottom of the boat because you are darker, be sold, starved, shot at the border like a sick animal, be pitied, lose your name, lose your family, make a refugee camp a home for a year or two or 10, stripped and searched, find prison everywhere, and if you survive and you are greeted on the other side with go home blacks, refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers, sucking our country dry of milk, dark with their hands out, smell strange, savage, look what they've done to their own countries, what will they do to ours? The dirty looks in the street, softer than a limb torn off. The indignity of everyday life, more tender than 14 men who look like your father, between your legs, insults easier to swallow than rubble than your child's body in pieces. For now, forget about pride. Your survival is more important. I wanna go home, but home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of the gun, and no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore, unless home tells you to leave what you could not behind, even if it was human. No one leaves home until home is a damp voice in your ear saying, leave. Run now. I don't know what I've become. Jesus was born into an occupied territory whose fate was determined by the wind and whims of Rome. Before he was even born, geography drove theology with respect to his own identity, his message, and his destiny. I'll tell you what I tell my students all the time. Anything I say or do in this classroom, I never expect anybody to agree with me or accept anything I'm saying. So everything I throw out there is a thought experiment for people to just play with. Um, so same with, with our time here today. Um, and believe me, my students take me up on the offer of contesting me and uh, the things I think and say, and uh, they're very good at, at uh, putting me in my place. Um, so uh, with Jesus, when you're talking about our subject and we're just doing a flyover and I want to kind of tickle your brain about things you'd have to think about. I mean, I'm kind of envisioning if all of you went back to your church and we're going to teach on the subject of geography and the Bible, what are some things you can talk about? 
right? So that's what you've kind of got in front of you. So you could talk about that, things like what we just did with the infancy narratives. You could talk about other places uh, in the Old Testament for geography uh, in the New Testament. So um, when Jesus, so continue with the Matthew theme, um, where does Jesus go early in his ministry? He grows up. He's going into ministry. And the first thing, if you're reading Mark, for instance, he's driven into the wilderness, right? <laughs> Which is right outside. Yeah, you can go to Jer Jericho. Go over to Jericho and see the church. Because also, I love Christians. They're, it's very handy because we run around and we build, um, build churches on everywhere and everything Jesus did. So you can go... Uh, you can actually go visit all the places. My favorite, I was in Mount Tabor a few weeks ago at the Church of the Transfiguration, and I was there with a couple of colleagues and one who's an ethicist and, um, and, and a pastor, another person who's a pastor, and we're there, and like, uh, it was so funny because we're reading the story of the Transfiguration on Mount Tabor. And we'll just look at it real quick. Luke 9, we have time. Um, in Luke 9, um, yeah, uh, Um, so 928, <laughs> it's a great story. If I would show you slides, but I don't want to mess with getting out of the PowerPoint because we might never get it back again. But uh, now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on a mountain to pray. Right? And uh, while he was saying, trust me, you're, when you're thinking, when you're going up Mount Tabor, it takes a long time. And it's nothing but switchbacks. And it's really intense. And you're like, did he really walk? Did they walk? This is a long way to come to pray. You must have really needed to be away from people. Um, but while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men. Who? Moses and Elijah, who are two huge prophets in, in uh, the Old Testament. Right? So it's when you're trying to understand who Jesus is, for Luke, he's one of the great prophets, along like Moses and Elijah. So anyway, it's not surprising, those are the two who show up. They appear in glory, and we're speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep since they had stayed awake. They saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter <laughs> said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said, because he's Peter. Um, while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them. What does this remind you of from the Old Testament? Right? Uh, so this is, again, pillar of the cloud, right? All of this kind of typology. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. By the way, side note, the only other place where this language of being overshadowed occurs in the Gospel of Luke is what happens with the Holy Spirit uh, that overshadows Mary. And so Mary's ministry is tightly connected to her son's ministry because she goes on to sing the Magnificat and Jesus then goes on to act out his mother's Magnificat. So not accidental language, nothing accidental in these scriptures. So anyway, the, from the cloud came a voice that said, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. They kept silent and uh, told nobody of anything. So when you go to Mount Tabor, we're like reading this story and it's really poignant. And then you walk inside the church, the church that was built on the spot, right? Peter's like, let's build a dwelling place. And Jesus is like, no, fam, right? So the, not only is there a church there, there's also a side chapel to Elijah and one to Moses. <laughs> We're like, thank you for your suggestion, Jesus. It's like so, so human. We're like, yeah, but no, this would be a better way to do things. Yeah, so that's very funny. So the language of, um, of wilderness um, gets picked up and Jesus says his, his temptation is in the wilderness. And you can see it from Jericho if you go go today. Again, we, we looked at John 1, 51, where uh, Bethel comes up. The, the Jacob's ladder takes place there. And so if you're going to understand who Jesus is, you need to understand something about Jacob and what he means to the tradition. And then in chapter 4, uh, which we'll look at in a little more detail, um, maybe after lunch, uh, he meets the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. So again, you're seeing all of our work from the morning, you know, come to fruition. And then the last thing I would point to before lunch, uh, another theme you'd want to play with if you were doing this subject in your church, is the Galilee, I want to say verses, Judea. It might be too strong of language. So Galilee is where Jesus conducts most of his ministry. Okay? Uh, in, the, in the synoptic gospels, by which I mean 
Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, so if you read those, because soon, S-Y-N, means with, and then optic means viewing. So they're called that because if you lay them next to each other, they look a lot alike. They have a lot in common. Then you have the Gospel of John, who's kind of doing its own thing. Um, has a different order of things and just stories that don't appear in other Gospels. It's missing stories that do appear in the synoptics. So in the synoptics, how long is Jesus' ministry? One year in the synoptics. Okay. In John, how long is his ministry? Three years. And that's where we get the notion. If you think of Jesus having a three-year ministry, it's because you've been influenced by the Gospel of John. And what happens is his traveling, the time gets marked in Jewish feasts and festivals, including the festival of Sukkot, the festival of booths, which is attached. Do you remember Jacob? Sukkot, you see it all coming together. Um, that, that time frame, they all gets punctuated by the feasts, Jewish feasts. And so you have Jesus going from Galilee, back and forth, back and forth, uh, in John. However, in the... Um, uh, so two things. When you're looking at the synoptics, you have a movement. Jesus does his ministry in Galilee, and then he moves. Let's say you're just looking at Luke. Then he moves from his ministry, and then they go, um, starting at Luke 9, they start moving to Jerusalem. And from chapters 9 to 18 of Luke, you have what we call the travel log of Luke. And there it's the journey from Galilee to Jerusalem, where Jesus, like Moses is doing in the wilderness, uh, uh, trains his uh, people about what it means to be the people of God. So on the way, they learn all the stuff you know about praying and fasting, all the things you know about being a Christian. Luke, from Luke, uh, come from 9 to 18 on this journey. He trains his, his insiders. So you see the importance of Jerusalem uh, in the text that we just read in Luke 9. If you'll refer to it again, in Luke 9. So after he does the transfiguration, he heals uh, somebody. He does the passion prediction. Uh, he, he says he's going to die. And then the disciples do their thing and say, yeah, but anyway, um, who's greatest among us? You know, whatever, you're dying, etc. cetera. Um, who's greatest? And then they go on with over, over here after they do that wine fest about that. They move on to uh, whining because somebody's casting out demons in Jesus' name, and they try to stop them, and it won't stop. And Jesus says, don't stop them. Whoever is not against you is for you. So then we hear this really important, um, important line. I would underline this or write this down in your notes if, you're, if you want to understand Luke. So Luke 9, 51, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, has multiple meanings because he's going to go up on a cross. He's going to ascend. He's going up to Mount Zion. Um, but when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And because Luke has already set us up, we know what that means, you know, what he's headed uh, towards. So it's very connected um, to the transfiguration story I just told you. Um, if you look back at the transfiguration story, um, look at verse 30, 930. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, right, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his, and if you have new RSV, it will say departure, which he is, was about to accomplish where? At Jerusalem. Okay, cross out departure in your Bible because the word there is exodus. Okay, so if you have a Greek New Testament, and I know some of you probably do, uh, the majority might not, but if you go to Luke chapter 9, verse 30, it, the word is, if I were going to put it into English letters, it's E X. O D O S. That's just the Greek letters exodon in here. Do you see how that's really, really more a much better translation and way more full of meaning that the author intends than departure? See, it's not accidental. So we've just been told that the Exodus, right? If Jesus is a prophet like Moses, he's about whatever he's doing, 
through his death, through, through all of this, the, through the travelogue, the, the taking his disciples on a long journey till he gets there. It's an exodus. And, it's, and Jerusalem is a crucial place for it. And so it's, it's not like, oh, in nine, Luke 9.51, oh, yeah, now the story has to keep on going, so now we've done some Galilee, and anyway, now we're going to go to Jerusalem. It's heavy with meaning. It's Jerusalem, yes, literal, but it's, it means he's going to, like, right, to Jerusalem in that sense. So, so Jerusalem looms uh, very large in that way. Um, uh, so that's one example you could do with Luke. And then the last example... Um, I would point out John is different because Jesus doesn't make a one-time trip. I'm not including, by the way, his trip to the temple when he's 12. I'm talking about once he starts his ministry. So in John, we say all geography is theology. Because actually in the Bible, from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation, all geography is theology. Okay. So the way it works in John is um, Jesus gets into... Um, let me put it this way. When he's in Galilee, in John, the music is happy and light and very, um, you know, you're drinking wine at Cana. It's like, don't worry, be happy. Um, right? It's happy place, nothing goes wrong for him in Galilee. Right? And then what happens whenever he heads towards Jerusalem, his disciples people are like, oh, don't go there, they want to kill you there, etc. So there's an animosity set up between Galilee and Jerusalem. Okay, and it's because of what it stands for, because Jerusalem is the center of the establishment, the religious establishment, right, that Jesus is kind of having, um, having issues with. So you'll notice in John, whenever he's in Galilee, that, that's home. Let me put it that way. Home, in that sense of the word, his people, where he belongs, where he's safe, whatever, is Galilee. Not home is when he goes to the center of religious authority. That's when his life becomes in danger. And then, of course, he is finally um, uh, crucified there. So it's interesting. I said in a little advertisement for this class, I think one of the things I said is, you know, so it's interesting. Why are Jesus' disciples called Galileans? Why not just, you know, Palestinian or you know, whatever? Like, because Galilee is, you know, home in that sense of the word. It's where he's successful and where he spends most of his time doing ministry. Um, so it's literal and metaphorical. So that's why when Peter, they, the, standing around the fire in John, they go, are you a Galilean? So Galilean is synonymous with Christian in that way. You see? Um, so again, the geography gets tied into religious identity um, as well. And we hear in Antioch, uh, where, where Christians are first um, called Christians. So.